चला गुरुदेव की जय श्रीमन महाप्रभु की जय श्री गिरिराज महाराज की जय श्री श्री जगन्नाथ ज्वाला देव की वादू की जय श्री हरिनाम संकीर्तन की जय गोर भक्त वृंद की गोर गुड मॉर्निंग टोक्यो प्रणाम वेलकम थैंक यू फॉर कमिंग um to all of you connected online as well and we are continuing our morning series of questions and answers so you are more than welcome to share whatever questions you may have here i see that there's one question already in the chat from brindavan das jai man mahatu ki jai We'll begin with Brindavan Das's question, and then we'll continue if there are any other question there may be. So he's asking the following. There is a popular statement that says that when the disciple is ready, the guru will come. What is the Gaudiya perspective on that? And is there some Shastric statement in that respect? So that's a question of Vrindavan Dham Das. So we'll begin with, with this one. So yeah, this is, we, we have heard that maybe, we have heard that this, this saying, it's not precisely that I know at least, the shloka per se, <laughs> but this notion of when the disciple is ready, the guru will come. And of course, it's true, but at the same time, we need to to explain the implications of that idea because it may sound like very mystical, or maybe you may feel yourself, I'm ready, the guru is not coming. <laughs> so the emphasis, of course, of this idea is that it's not only on the part of the guru that things have to be in place, but also on the part of the disciple is 50 and 50% 50 equation. It's not just, of course, the disciple will feel I'm nobody and by the guru, by the grace of my guru, Dev, everything is coming. It's just his, her costless mercy and just a worthy recipient of his grace and so on. But all that also shouldn't be an excuse to being lazy and say, no, everything is 100% him, him, herself, and I'm just like, so falling that I cannot do anything now. This guru will, won't, won't accept that. <laughs> So, in one sense, it's a, again a 50 50 percent equation. The guru, of course, has to be in place and the disciple has to be in place. So, regarding if there are any shastric statement in that in this connection, of course, again, there is no single verse that I know of, at least, that says this idea directly. But all of the verses that speak about the qualities of the guru and the qualities of the disciple are basically implying this notion so there are three main i will say of course there are many but three main verses that speak about the qualities of the guru and interestingly in those three verses also the qualities of the disciples are mentioned like implying you cannot speak about one thing without the other so there is one verse from the srimad bhagavatam there's one verse from the bhagavad gita and there is one verse from the Upanishads, Svitaspatara hmm? Upanishad, if I'm not mistaken. So we can mention these verses <laughs> and, uh, and briefly under and analyze. The three of them basically are saying the same thing in different nuanced ways, but the same idea is there. So <clears throat> the verse from the Svitaspatara Upanishad, again, if it is Svitaspatara Upanishad, it's that Vigyanartam Sagurumi Babi Gachet. <clears throat> so, first line is more connected to the disciple, and second line, line with the two of them, <laughs> Guru and disciple. So, first line says, Tad Vigyanartam Saguru Mi So, Tad Vigyanartam means uh, if someone is looking for Vigyanartam, for 
knowledge or wisdom, realized knowledge about the ultimate purpose of life, such person then must surrender to a guru. Not like in forced imposition, but like if you want that, you have to do that. Like with feeling, you have to accept the guru. If you are looking for life's ultimate goal. So that there the adhikar for the disciples starts to be shown. You have to have a certain level of inquiry. No, I, I'm not looking for a guru just to solve my, I don't know, financial, emotional, material problem. I'm interested in knowing what's the ultimate goal of life. Only in that direction you need a guru. Sometimes some disciples will tell Sila Prabhupada, so everyone needs a guru. And he will say, no, everyone does need a guru. <laughs> Only those who are interested in reaching this ultimate purpose, they need a guru. So the first line, again, shows the standard for a disciple, if you will. And the second line further qualifies that, saying, Samitpani, Srotriyam Brahmanishma. So Samitpani means, this is speaking in like all the Upanishadic terms. So Samitpani means he should carry the wood for sacrifice. So you have to travel in time a little bit <laughs> to understand this symbology. And implies that disciple assisting his guru in the execution of gyagna. So for the gyagna, so aha, you need some wood to put in the fire. So the disciple will go to the forest and collect, like we see with Krishna and uh, Sudam when going to the forest when they were in the Guru pool with Sandipani Muni. He sent them, please bring wood from the forest for my daily execution of gyagna. So the, but the idea of what's the idea of Jaknya? What's the idea of the wood for sacrifice as we spoke mm -hmm. these days? So, uh -huh. so uh, means I give myself, so uh, my own self, uh, I enter, I give myself to the fire. The fire means sacrifice. So the symbology behind this that the disciple should carry the wood of sacrifice means he or she should be willing to do sacrifice, I mean, to, to dedicate himself, herself in the service of three gurus. So he should have a serving disposition, if you will. And that further qualifies the idea of saguru me You should surrender to your guru. But in which way? Giving yourself to that person. And again, that should be natural, voluntarily done. Uh, ideally, after knowing each other for some period of time. That's also what Srila Sanatan Goswami recommends. Guru and disciples should know each other at least five, four, during a period of a year. Traditionally, they were living together in the Guru pool. So one thing is to know someone for a year living together, another thing is to know someone for a year without living together. You don't get to get the person to know that person that much. One thing is, I know all of you, but another thing is, let's go to live together for a year. <laughs> then we all know each other <laughs> with all our ups and downs. So, and we will see if we want to remain together after that year. <laughs> so something like that. No? So that's the idea in the sense of do not rush. No, do not like run and, and accept a guru or the guru accept the disciple without knowing each other. It's for the two persons. It's not just for the disciple. Oh, I have to know if the guru is qualified or not. The, the, the guru will examine also the person, not dis distrusting, distrusting, but just objectively verifying. Are we up to the challenge? Because again, it's a challenge to have a guru. It's a challenge to have a disciple. <laughs> Do not think only it's a challenge to have a guru. No? For the guru also it's a challenge to have disciples. So it's, it's a challenge in both directions. We get to re really get to know each other and to agree, okay, let's let's continue with this commitment. Two-way street commitment. So this is the adhikar for the disciple. Mm -hmm. Surrender, dedication, and a certain quality of inquiry, sincerity of inquiry. And that has lots of implication. It's not just an intellectual inquiry. What's your goal of life? Guru will say, love of God. Oh, thank you, Guru. There. Okay, so question solved. Oh, how to reach there? <laughs> As we spoke yesterday, what's the goal? Sadhya and sadhana. It's not enough to know the sadhya. The goal is this. Okay, so the next question is, what do I have to do to reach there? Sadhana. And sadhana has so many implications, not just chant your rounds, 
do this, do, 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 and everything works magically. In the, in the midst of all that, so many things start to happen and one needs to know how to navigate those, those waters, those dynamics. And so that's on the part of the disciple. And then the last terms of the verse says, Shrotriyam Brahmanista. That applies to the guru. Now the qualities of the, interestingly, most of the verse, almost 75% of the verse speaks who a disciple should be. <laughs> and then it says who the guru should be. Brahma, Shrotriyam Brahmanista. Very similar to, we will see what the Bhagavatam and the Gita also says. So Shrotriya means he should be expert in the Shruti, which means in the Shruti means that which is here and refers to revealed knowledge. So the Guru should have a deep command of sacred scripture, should know in theory this the Shastra deeply, because if not, the Guru won't be able to reply to the doubts of the disciple in the context of revelation and thus nourish his hair Shastra Shraddha. Do you follow my point? I mean, if, if the guru, a guru may charismatic and may know how to answer reply, reply questions without resorting to Shastra, but by doing so, he will make the disciple get accustomed to think, oh, my questions can be replied without the need of going to Shastra. So he will, he may be satisfied or she may be satisfied with those replies, but he or she may be accustomed to, we don't need to go to Shastra for questions. So he, he may even develop faith, but that won't be Shastra. <laughs> that won't be faith in what revelation has to say about this particular topic, but just faith without the need of going to Shastra. And that's called the Rupa Goswami Ko, Laukiki Shraddha or Komal Shraddha also some other terms, but you know, Thakur has given, which means weak faith, basically. It's like uh, not deep faith, emotional, sentimental faith, which is there. I mean, for some reason, our, our acharyas have used this term. They know that can happen. And there is a place for that. Even in the beginning, your guru may be posting Shastra, but you may not be so interested in, in that. <laughs> but the point is that the guru at least should be doing his part, her part of replying to the questions by pointing to revelation, mm -hmm. giving that, putting that un replying context. Because if not, again, the disciple will be accustomed to, we don't need Shastra. We can just reply and speak in terms of human common sense and logic and analogies from this world and whatever I feel is correct. But in order to speak about transcendence, we need to resort to Shastra because Shastra is transcendence itself extending to us. So we can know something about it. If not, there is no way to know about it. You can use logic, human common sense. You can have all the best intentions in the world, but it's not enough to, <laughs> to gain penetration into transcendence. For that, you need transcendence itself, extending itself to you. So let's see that Maharaj will say, we are finite. How can we get to the infinite? Impossible. But if the infinite, out of his own compassion and will, makes himself available to us, then we can know. And that's what we call Shastra. Shastra is not a book. Sometimes we have this wrong idea. Oh, Shastra. Shastra, there is all this book, 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 book. <laughs> but actually Shastra means Shabda Brahma. The absolute in the form of sound reaching to us through parampara. And all that takes the form of printed stuff if you will, <laughs> but it's much more beyond than that. <clears throat> so the first quality of the guru, as we will see in every single verse that speaks about the gurus, he's expert in Shastra. He must have theoretical, and it's not just knowing a few verses, if you will. It's not just like, I learned the main five verses of the Gita or whatever, the Chatur Shloki, uh, I'm qualified to be a guru. Who wants to be my disciple now <laughs> or something? <laughs> but deep, deep command. And it's not only theoretical knowledge, but really get to the gist, the intention, the, seeing the whole trust and context, that to sum up by us, being able to present how all these sounds are pointing 
into one single direction, into two single sounds, Krishna, oh, Krishna. So, but again, Shrotriyam and then Brahmanishta. Brahmanishta means not only theoretical knowledge of the absolute, but realized knowledge. So he or she should be expert in theory and practice. Brahman nishtam means nishtam means fixed, fixed in Brahman. He should be fixed in Brahman. Brahman means the absolute, basically. It's an Upanishadic term. It doesn't refer, refer necessarily to impersonal Brahman, as we call sometimes. Brahman is a way of speaking about the absolute in general, transcendence in general, in the Upanishads. So Brahman nishtam means Sri Guru must be establishing firm realization of transcendence. On some level, that's what we said the other day. At least the guru should be a Madhyam Bhakta. Madhyam means Nishta, and Nishta means Brahmanishta. <laughs> so there's a, a level of fi fixity. Okay. Sorry? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> of being fixed in, in transcendence. So this is the first verse, one of the three main ones that speak about the guru and the disciple. The second one, I, I won't take too much time to the, with the remaining two because they basically say the same. It's from the Bhagavatam, famous verse, Tasmat Guru Prabhadita Kignasu Sri Autama Chabdi Pari Chanishnatam Brahmani Upasumashraya. It's basically saying the same thing. It says Tasmat, Tasmat means therefore, so you have to connect this verse with the previous ones because it says therefore, you mean therefore what? So before that, it was saying how a soul wandering in this world, like having different experiences on this plat platform, is willing to inquire beyond, and beyond what's going on here, and have gained some experience of everything here is temporary, and so on and so on. So that person is interested in what's beyond the temporariness of this world. So therefore, that he is such a person, Gurum Chasmat Gurum Prapadita, should surrender Prapadita, Prapadya, to Sri Guru. So, again, the same idea. Tad Guru Me Babi Gache, Saguru Me Babi Gache, Tad Guru Prapadita. It's the same idea, Chasmat Guru Prapadita. So, someone with that type of impetus, with that level of inquiry, again, should surrender to Guru. The second line of the verse further qualifies that saying. Jignashu Shreya Uttama, which is the same idea of Tad Bigyanartam. We can make all these parallels between one verse and the other. Tad Bigyanartam in the Upanishadic verse means he's inquiring into the knowledge or related to the ultimate goal. And Shreya, Jignashu Shreya Uttama is basically the same. Jignashu means he's inquiring, Atatu Brahma Jignashu. Shreya Uttama. Uttama means the topmost, the highest, and uh, Shreya means benefit. So Shreya Uttama means the ultimate benefit, the ultimate goal of life, Jignasu. He should be willing, she should be willing to get to that point that we were speaking yesterday. You may say, oh, the, for me, this is a guru say, Eo bahya, agi kahe. Oh. That's superficial, go deeper. <laughs> and you have your own conception. Oh, this is a goal, a guru say, that's still superficial, let's go deeper. And you should be willing to continue. Say, oh, Guru, Guru Dev, I'm tired of this journey. And always go deeper, always. This is what spiritual life is about, go deeper. So these first two lines, again, speak about the disciple. He or she should be, uh, should have some, some understanding about the necessity for spiritual life. It's not so much, I want a guru, but I need a guru. I want can be just my whimsical desire, a fashion like movement. Oh, all my friends have a guru. I also want one. I don't want to be just a weird one in the group, a social, social issue or something. No, I need the guru. For feeling I need, you have to reach some personal conclusion and insight that why do I need a guru? What's the role of guru? And what's the role of the disciple? And the two last lines of this verse of the Bhagavatam go back to describe who is the Guru. Shabdi Parich and Ishnatam Brahmani Upashamasrayam. So a Guru should be Shabdi Pari Shinishnatam. So again, this is the same idea of uh, Brahm, uh, Shrotriyam Brahmanishtam. Shabdi Nishnatam 
qualify Shabde and Pare. Shabde refers to Shabda, to Shruti, to the reveal sound. And Pare refers to not only having theoretical knowledge of Shabda, Shabde, but having insight of Shabda, realization. And Nishnatam, the word Nishnatam means, how do you say in English? Oh, no, no, it's coming in English. <laughs> Let me exercise it a little bit. Right? Drenched. Drenched? Drenched. 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 Like deeply immersed, basically. So Nishnata means drenched. So that applies both to Shabdi and to Pari. So the Guru should be drenched in knowledge of Shastra. He should be living in the scripture. He should be really immersed in what Shastra has to say. He should be expert in the knowledge of Shastra, on one level or another. I mean, but expert. Expert means already a level. <laughs> there are levels of that. You know, Shastra Nipun, that's the quality of Anutam Bhakta, says Rupa Goswami. He's a scriptural genius. But to say that Imadi and Bhakta may not be a scriptural genius, but he should have wide knowledge of Shastra. Scriptural genius doesn't mean necessarily he knows a lot, but he has a genius-like capacity of taking from any sections and putting everything in context in the proper context. Like, I don't know, Jiva Goswami is doing his Sandharvas. He's taking from different dar Vedant darshans from India and everything and showing how all of this converges into the point of bhakti. So, Sabdev Parich and Ishnatam. So the Guru should be immersed in knowledge of Shastra. He should be immersed in realization of that knowledge. He should have deep realization, just not lip service to, to, to the scripture. So again, this is what the Bhagavatam is saying. What's the Guru? I mean, we should use this as a, how do you say in English? Yardstick to really have an idea. And that's why it takes time to understand. With who we have to take time for them. So Sabdi Pari Chanishnatam, and just in case to further qualify the Pari Nishnatam, the last line says Brahmani Upashama Asrayam. So Brahmani Upashama Asrayam means he should be firm, firmly situated in, in, in Brahman, in the spirit. Upashama Asrayam. So Upashama Asrayam. He has taken shelter, Asraya, Asraya, in Upashama. Upashama means like like equanimity and peacefulness and so on. So it's a way of saying his senses should be under control. Like, it's, of course, that's not the, the ultimate quality of a guru. It's not that you control your senses, you're a guru, but at least that's the most overt, explicit way you can begin. Because you say, where to begin to see if the guru is qualified or not? Well, pay attention if his her senses are under control. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good way of putting that first verse of Upadishamrita. Ucho Begum, Anasa Krodha Begum, Jiva Begum, Udara Pasha Begum, Pita Begum, Yobi Sahita Dida. Satishya. So there is a speaking about who is that person under whose shelter the whole planet can become a Sishya or a disciple. And it begins saying, the same thing that Mahaprabhu said to Raghunadas Goswami, Gramya Katana Sunibi, Gramya Vartana Kaibi. You know, understand this mudra? <laughs> Control your tongue, your speech. Do not gossip. It sounds like the basic, but do not gossip. I mean, you have to begin somewhere. <laughs> so the great, this personality will have control under all these begams or impulse, impulses, mm -hmm. urges, urges. No? Speech, mind, tongue, stomach, genital order or organ, anger also. All this, there's like a, a line. But the point is, pay attention to that to begin with. The guru should be under under control, sense control. Again, some other person can be sense control also. The guru will have added features apart from that. But that will become clear. And if you live with someone for a year, like the classical system, you you have to you you, you pay co close attention. You will realize if the person is under control or not, his her senses. So this is what the Bhagavatam has to say about guru and disciple. And the last verse, in reply to Vrindavan Dam's question. 
is a famous word from the Bhagavad Gita. Tadbidi pranipatena pariprasnena sivaya padikshanti te jnanam jnaninas tattvadarshinaha. From a different angle, it's saying the same. Krishna is saying to Arjuna there, he's speaking about tadbidi pranipatena pariprasnena. The order is, of words is different here. But basically he's saying tadbidi, no? Tadbidi, he's the, the fourth chapter of the Gita. This appears in the fourth chapter, verse 34. Krishna is speaking about knowledge. There, the chapter is called Gyan Yoga. But in this context, it, it, for us, it applies to the knowledge concerning Bhakti. There is a type of Gyan there, Sambandha Gyan, and so on. So Krishna said, Tat, Tat means that knowledge, Bhiti. If you want to know that knowledge, if you want to receive education on that, on transcendence, Pranipatena, Pariprasnena, Sivaya. You have to go to the Guru and you have to engage in these three steps. Pranipat, Pariprasna, and Siva. In this order, which is important. <laughs> Surrender, in humble inquiry, and Seva, service. Sometimes we, we want to jump into service, <laughs> but we want to jump into surrender. <laughs> That's another fire of itself. So first surrender, pranipat means surrender. Chila Prabhupada interestingly translates that in his Gita translation as approach a guru. Like implying, how do you approach a guru? Surrender. That's the way to approach. It's not just physical proximity. I'm approaching him. <laughs> no. Internally, anugatya, no? by giving ourselves to whatever that person represents. So surrender. That's the same idea of the other verses. Iva bigachet. Prapadita pranipatena. A similar term for the same idea. Saranagati is the foundation of our bhakti project. And surrender after you have your own experiences when you realize I need, I want this, I need this. And you understand who is that person? Okay. We have mutual agreement, I surrender. <laughs> or at least you begin to surrender because again, surrender is it. A process. It's not that from day one I press the button, surrender button, and there, there are installments of that. So pranipat, pariprasna. Pariprasna means. Uh, inquiry. I have a question. I have a question, but with humility, proper question. I mean, you already are surrender on some level, so it means the question will come from the context of surrender. The point is, I'm surrendered on some level. And I would like to be more surrendered. So all my questions will be in the context of how can I nourish my pranipat? How my prani prashna will be, how can I nourish my pranipat? How can I nourish my surrender? It was not just intellectual curiosity or like challenging. Uh, I, I don't believe that. I have a question. This is not, it's not from that side. That's not body pressure. So that won't help. And then seva. <laughs> Then <laughs> Seva. No. Whereas you surrender, you clean your Taos, whatever you need to know. And again, the Guru will reply to you by quoting Shastra, we were explaining. You will be fully satisfied. Your faith will be nourished. In the context of revelation, Shastriya Shraddha, your Guru will instruct you. Your faith has to be nourished in that way. So I will quote Shastra to nourish your faith. So naturally, the conclusion will be how can I? reciprocate to that. I feel I'm receiving so much from this person, so much. My whole life is having new meaning and purpose and so I want to please Sri Guru. So that means seva. Seva doesn't mean just service. Because sometimes for us service can mean just doing stuff. So becoming like hyperactive, basically. <laughs> How they say though, nowadays when people do many things at the same time? Multitasking. multitasking. Yeah, multitasking and super engagement. <laughs> and that's not necessarily seva. If there is not pranipat and pariprasna before, surrender and humility, what seva is that? So seva means trying to please the object of our affection in a, in a concentrated way. I really want that. I really want to provide some some pleasure to that, to my well wishing, to my garden. So first, those things have to be in place. No, it sounds simple, but this is the magical formula, if you will, for relating to Sri Guru. Surrender, humility, service. <laughs> and everything will come from that. So that's in this verse of the Gita, though all this speaks 
to the disciple first. No? That's expected from the disciple. And then, how the verse goes? Upadek shanti te jnana, jnana stacho darshana. So upadek shanti te jnana, if you approach in that way, Sri Guru, they will accept you, they will sometimes translate it, initiate you into these mysteries of love, Rajaguhyam, uh, and they will provide this knowledge again that knowledge is a big part of the interaction between guru and disciple we could say that technically speaking the guru the role of the guru is to teach shastra to the disciple by precept and by example and of course to teach shastra again it's not just memorizing some sections of an old dusty book but again what's shastra revelation and what's revelation the absolute itself extending himself to us. So what's Shastra? Krishna. <laughs> so what does it mean to teach Shastra? It means to give Krishna to basically. And it has a theoretical side and it has its realized side. It's not just let's sit and, and, and because sometimes we, of course, in practice, we will say we will go to the class. No, we won't say let's go and receive Krishna in the morning. And someone say, what do you mean by that? <laughs> uh, let's go to the class. But we should be aware of the implications of that. It's not just, I will chant some rounds. What does it mean, chant some rounds? I mean, you're having darshan of Radha and Krishna in the form of divine song in the more merciful way. Maybe you won't say that when you will chant rounds. <laughs> I will have darshan of Radha and Krishna in the most merciful way. And you mention, what do you mean? I, I will chant some rounds. <laughs> okay. So in practical terms, we will say, I will go to the class. I will chant some rounds. I will read the Bhagavatam, but we should be aware of what's really happening. Even though I'm not fully aware of that, I don't have full insight. I know that's present on the other side. I know what Harinam really means, what the Bhagavatam really is, what Shastra really is. It is a life, a life principle. There is a person there. <laughs> so to bear that in mind, the Guru has to help us to bear that in mind over and over and over again. So and last line will further describe who is the guru okay, in the same line. Srotriyam Brahmanistam Sabdi Parichanishnatam Jnanas Tattva Darshina. So the guru is Jnani and Tattva Darshina. So Jnani in this sense doesn't mean Jnani as sometimes the Buddhist is determined. I say derogative way. No, he's a Jnani. <laughs> Sometimes even I've seen devotees criticizing other devotees who like to study Shastra. Oh, he's a jnani. <laughs> and here the Bible, Christians in the Gita, the Guru is a jnani. <laughs> so be careful of only understanding jnani as something negative. I mean, the Guru is jnani, so we should follow his her footsteps. We should become jnani. Jnani means someone endowed, endowed with, yeah, with knowledge. A knowledge of somebody. Yeah, some bandagya, knowledge of revelation, knowledge of how everything has Krishna as its center. That's sambanda, basically. Sambanda means learning to see everything in connection to its source. And the natural result of that is abhideya. Abhideya means, I mean, the, 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 the unavoidable consequence of sambanda. <laughs> Someone gives you some bandha and really shows you how everything is connection of Krishna. Naturally, you will think I should act, act accordingly. So that translates that bhakti, avideya. That's bhakti basically, like the result of proper sambanda. Of course, sambanda is bhakti in itself. <laughs> to receive this knowledge from Sigur is bhakti in itself, and that will take us to engage in, to conduct in our life and set according to. Sambanda, which means Krishna is the center and all its energies, Maya Shakti, Jiva Shakti, Swarup Shakti exist for his pleasure. And we are one of them, so we have to figure out what to do. So the Guru's Jnani, <clears throat> he's again knowledgeable of Shastra. He's, the other verses call him Shotriyam, or Shabdi Nishnatam. He's drenched in revelation, he's expert in the revealed sound, however you like to put it. Those, these two are the always and always the quality of the guru. He's expert in theoretical knowledge of the shastra, so he knows how to reply, how to solve the doubts of the disciple. And tattva darshina, which is another way of saying brahmanistam, regarding the first verse, 
we quote from the Upanishads, or another way of saying, Pari Nishnata, which means, in this case, Krishna is putting that, he's a seer, seer of, of, of truth. Now, he's not only knowing the truth in theory, tattva, tattva means truth in very simple ways. And darshana means someone who is having darshana. So darshana is a, a seer of truth. He's having darshan, he's seeing that. He's having insight. He has the eye, if you will. He sees things through the Shastra. That's another way to put it. There's this expression called Shastra Chakshu. So Chakshu means what? Eyes. And Shastra means Shastra. <laughs> so Shastra Chakshu means the eyes of Shastra. The Guru is seeing everything through the filter of Shastra. And that's why it is said that the Guru gives us new eyes. What do we say on the daily basis? Omagyana timirandasya gyanam jana shalaka chakshu militam jina kashmir shri. The Guru is giving us proper eyes, proper vision. And what does it mean? It's not just like some magical touch like, wow, so Krishna. <laughs> but he, she's teaching Shastra. He's living accordingly. He's living his, her life through those lens. And he's educating me on doing the same. That's, I replace my eyes. I learn to appreciate reality with different lens. Like when you have a lens and the lens are red, everything is red. For you, it's not that everything is red. <laughs> the lens are red. <laughs> so you'll see everything through the lens of Raja Guna. It's, your lens are red. You, you put some black lens, everything is black. Tamaguna. The Guru will give some like multicolor lens of Shastra, which shed light of reality from particular perspectives. So, so that means his gift, her, her gift. No? He's giving us Shastra and the way of understanding Shastra. So, so this is my reply to Vrindavan that last question. <laughs> he was asking for those who just came now that there is this saying that says, when the disciple is ready, the guru will come. So what's our view on that? In one sense, we agree, understanding what we have said. Like if the disciple, understanding what is expected from a disciple is in its place, everything is in its place, proper inquiry, disposition of service, sincere, willingness to, to sacrifice for, for, for in the pursuit of truth, yeah, naturally, the figure of the guru will, will come. If someone says, I've been hungering for a guru for 34, 50 years, and it never came, <laughs> with all respect, but I will have my reservations and doubts about what's your inner motivation for having a guru. Because again, it's not a fashion. Thing, right? It's Krishna himself, in one sense, appearing in a representational way, sense, so I can give fully, give myself. And it's a person that will have the capacity of receiving and consuming all my service tendency and know how what to do with that, not take that for himself or herself. You know? But that's we were speaking about that some weeks ago. Like the role of the guru is so delicate because you are receiving so much. Um, like energy, if you will, to, to put it in some terms, from your students. So much love, prayers, dedication. You have, maybe you don't have many disciples, but whatever, even if it's one. <laughs> I mean, if you have a person in your life that is really surrendering to you, you will feel the impact. If you are a guru, you will feel the impact of that coming to your life. That, that person is really giving himself, herself fully, time, energy, prayers, sadhana, focusing that part. So you have to know what to do with that thing. Because that thing is coming to you and it's empowering you, I thought. So that's why you may see, I mean, there are different types of empowerment. Of course, the guru should be empowered by his, his or her own sadhana and practice and insights. But another feature is his own students will empower him or her by investing so much energy and time and surrender that comes that's an, an energy that comes to the person and you have to know what to do with that <laughs> if you forget this is coming from them and you think oh i'm so empowered now <laughs> immediately your fall down begins when you realize they are the ones empowering me 
And this energy does not belong to me. It's not for me to enjoy or to keep or to put my signature below. Mm -hmm. It's my Shaktivish avatar mm -hmm. feature. <laughs> but it's by their grace that this is coming to me. This does not belong to me. All this energy I have to continue keeping directing that to my own Guru Dev, and that's what Parampara is about. Under and also to serve my disciples. Mm -hmm. That's a natural exchange. Mm -hmm. But if at some point the guru forgets this and thinks all this energy is mine and for me and whatever, that's a problem. <laughs> so, so some things that we were sharing. So ideally, yeah, if the disciple is in place, uh, the, the, guru, the guru principle will manifest because Krishna, at least in the form of Paramatma, is in everyone's heart to begin with <laughs> as a Chaitya Guru. So Guru is already there, if you will, <laughs> in one manifestation. When, so when you arrive, if you will, when you are ready for that, that will come somehow or other. And we should be, of course, willing and open. If we are really willing and open and sincere, we, we will have it clear that Guru may not appear in the form that we were thinking of, because also you may have your own prejudice. So, well, he should be like this and that and appear flying from the sky and long beard and Indian or non-Indian or woman or man and this and that. It will be something else. But if you are sincere, <clears throat> the Guru principle will make it clear. This is it. No? So, some ideas, Vrindavan Dam, Prabhu. Hopefully that it helps. So I extended a little bit in this reply. Sorry for that. <laughs> so are there any other questions? Can I ask something related to what you said? What do you say? We have three hands three hands raising. So mm -hmm. You have to show your bite now, <laughs> gentleman. Oh, yeah. no, it's related. No, my, no, it's Yes, if there are follow-up questions, yeah, we yeah. will continue with them and then all the three are follow-up yeah. questions. Okay. <laughs> we will go to the three, no problem. It's more, it's not that, uh, yeah, you said one time we cannot say to the Guru, like, I am tired, no more progress, but, but if we feel like this. <laughs> yeah, you can tell that to the Guru, but not because as an excuse to stop doing progress. You can say, Guru Dev, I'm, I feel tired of making progress, like implying it's my problem. <laughs> so help me to solve that. Of course, also, when I, when I say that, it, it means... The relationship with the guru should be sustainable it's not that the, also the guru will be like torturing the disciple like more progress further progress go deeper you're still superficial i mean i'm not saying that the guru should be compassionate and, and but also compassionate means many things <laughs> you know it means to understand okay for today that's enough you can take rest now <laughs> but compassion also means pinching and taking out out of the comfort zone when that's required but not to the point of paranoia and the disciple that this is too much, the guru is asking too much from me. The following point. So yeah, if, if, if one as a disciple will go through some, some particular stage that can happen, at least it will reach certain level like Nishta. Because when you reach Nishta or become a Madhyam Bhakta, you are really, I mean, you have really a taste for progress, for going deeper. I mean, it becomes your life. You, so it won't be a problem. It's not like I go there. I want to stop making progress. <laughs> but before that, sometimes we may find ourselves like, yeah, affected by whatever, evasiveness or laziness, superficiality, distract, being distracted, and not being so concerned about progress. But if you know that, if you realize that already, that's a symptom, <laughs> a good symptom, <laughs> because some people may not be concerned with going deeper, and they may not realize that. They may even think I'm so advanced <laughs> that I don't need to move on from this, and that means you don't, you are, you do not care to go deeper. So if you really feel I, I, I realize I'm not so interested in going deeper, and, and you feel that's a problem, it's not that you congratulate yourself. <laughs> it, that's great. I mean, to, for that stage, you cannot also force yourself. I should be feeling so much ecstatic inspiration to go deep. I mean, maybe that's not yet that the corresponding stage for feeling that. So you shouldn't extra, extra torture no, in that way, but you should take the necessary steps. I know I should be willing to go deeper. That's what life is about, the survival of the fittest, if you will. <laughs> 
of the deepest. <laughs> <laughs> but but for some reason, I don't feel that. Why that's happening? So you present your case to your your guardians humbly, not like like in a rebel like way. I don't I don't want to go deeper. You want me to go deeper? Uh, I've decided that also. Okay, that's your choice and your problem because that's at that moment you stop being a disciple for for that moment at least because you didn't get what that means to be a disciple. Students forever. So let's see. That's our school. We are students forever. We are not just students for the first five years and now I want to be the senior devoting the community and to te teach everyone about what to do. I'm not a student anymore. <laughs> The more you become a teacher, the more you learn. I mean, the subject matter of my studies and ending. Then you are getting closer to the infinite. There is no limit for making progress. So, yeah, I think you, one should at that moment present the case humbly. Because also one should not be oh, no, embarrassed to, to make my guardians know that I feel this. But that would be a disciple also means to be transparent. To be humble, humble questions <laughs> doesn't mean just like putting your hands like this, as we said the other day, and making a show of humility. I have this question, Guru, there, please can you answer that for me? But also have the, the courage and the integrity of recognizing your most uh, embarrassing and I don't know if this word exists, but unconfessable, <laughs> <laughs> unconfessable moments. I mean, you have to share. It. That those deep dark sides with someone if not you go crazy and, and it's nice to feel that relief that i'm letting this person know the most embarrassing thing in my life and at the same time i fully trust that person is not judging me judging me because of that because i'm not that actually that's some shadow embarrassment but it's not my my swarup, my identity <laughs> so the guru has that has it to darshan. He knows that. She knows that. He should. So if you present yourself in the most embarrassing fashion, but trying to transcend that, not over identifying with that, and trying, the guru will really be compassionate and will bestow so much mercy and blessing and understand that and give us hope. So we need those moments. We need those intimate exchanges because if not, you just keep all the stuff for yourself and the guru comes and just present like the nice face of your life. Everything is okay. There's no problem. And after two weeks, you disappear and nobody knows where you are. And the guru will suffer so much. Where is such and such disciple? What happened? So again, there is something we have to do as disciples. And we have to learn how to be transparent and honest. That was, that's, that's the meaning of being a sadhu. Sadhu means honest person. In the context of what, in this case, spiritual pursuit. Satam, sadhu, sad means from sad, sad means truth. To be truthful, to be honest, to be transparent. That will take different forms in different stages. And reveal your mind, sometimes we'll be revealing your very unique insects and revelations. That's nice also. But sometimes we'll be sharing really embarrassing things. But if that embarrassing thing is shared in the context of making progress, that's not embarrassing. That's heroic. We'll say. <laughs> but most people are so fearful of doing that, even the boys, because we are attached to, I don't want anyone to let, I don't want to let anyone know how the disaster I'm still am. I am still in my practice as a sadhaka. But the, the problem is you are over identifying with that. You are not seeing your brilliant prospect. <laughs> And that's what the guru is seeing always. You're, he's not seeing your present embarrassment. He's just seeing all that you can be. And he's trying to take you there. But for you to reach there, you have to acknowledge where I am now. So we have to do our part. Also. Does it help? Yeah. Okay. So, so when it disappears, a oh. question card. No, yes. yeah. Oh, <laughs> he, re he reappeared. Yeah. Yeah. So I, have, I have a question related to this famous order of Lord Chaitanya Yaradeka Tarek Krishna gave clear. So he is saying that on my order I become uh, Aksa, uh, become guru and and preach Krishna Upadesha in your place and save the people. Like that. So this shloka implies that we should be first qualified or advanced <clears throat> to become guru and then preach or because he empower us we can 
we can be, act as a guru even without reaching the stage of nishta and this all quali qualities which you, Maharaj mentioned. Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So this, of course, this this is one of those famous verses that can be really misread <laughs> and say Mahaprabhu gave gave the instruction. Everyone should be a guru. So you can start initiating today. <laughs> Do not be cruel. You have to be merciful. You have to be sharing everything with all everyone else. So, so, um, yeah. How how to understand this? So Mahaprabhu saying this idea, no? like Yarde Katarika, Krishna Upadesh. That's the first part, which which means wherever you are, to whomever whomever you meet. Krishna Upadesh. Try to instruct them about Krishna. So, of course, this has some implications there. Because you will instruct someone about something only as much as you are walking the talk. No? I mean, Mahaprabhu is not saying that expecting you to be a hypocrite. Like, it doesn't matter if you are not practicing anything. You just speak about Krishna to people. I mean, he's not promoting that. He's not saying live your life in a nonsensical way, but speak about Krishna, please. <laughs> that will create a totally opposite effect. And, and we know Mahaprabhu himself. I mean, you have to put in context, he said that. Yeah, he said that. But what did he say through his example in, in his life? <laughs> How was his teaching? Sometimes, we, as we spoke, we say, sometimes he never even ever spoke to people because his achar was so powerful. He just converted the greatest pandit Sarvabhoma, like being silent. <laughs> no? So he had a deep achar, that's the point. So when he's saying instruct others about Krishna, first he's saying this deep achar. He's not saying just, he's not saying, sometimes the verse is translated speak about Krishna, but the verse says Krishna Upadesh, which means Upadesh, instruct others. About Krishna. Upadesh generally translated instruction, like Upadesh Amrita and so on. So instruct others. I can instruct you through through example also. Generally, that's the most powerful instruction. Because if I give it all a fancy lecture, <laughs> right at the end of my lecture, I, I whatever, I pick a cigarette and go to the casino nearby here and I start to offend all the Vaishnavs and do all kinds of nonsense. I mean my morning lecture will enter here and go there. Nothing remains. Because, and you, you won't be here for the tomorrow's morning lecture, for sure. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully, just in case. <laughs> so my point is, when Mahaprabhu is saying, Krishna Upadesh, instruct others about Krishna, first he's implying, leave the, leave the thing. I mean, it's a living thing. You have to enter there. And as much as you do that, you can speak. You don't speak more than what you are practicing or at least seriously aspiring to. Because sometimes we may speak about something that we may say, well, Maharaj, I'm speaking about Krishna, but I don't have full realization of Krishna. So what does it mean? I should never even mention the name Krishna then? <laughs> There's, and, and the point is you will never reach full realization. There's always a fuller level and a fuller level. So it means that no, it doesn't mean that. So it means try to be realistic, be sober, realize where you are standing at, and not, do not speak above your adhikar, your present level of eligibility, but say something, but do something first. If you, you know, practice, and as much as you practice, you have a, a right, if you will, to speak about that with some. I mean, something that will create a change in the heart of others. Because if I speak to you about something that has not changed my heart, my speech won't change your heart. Because I, me, myself, I do not believe my own words. Yes. <laughs> you fall. But when you hear the sadhu, that's why it's so important hearing Shastra from the lips of sadhu. Because you can take the book. And I'm not, I'm not against taking the book. But <laughs> I do take it. But... <laughs> On the order of my Guru Maharaj. No? Do you give me permission to read the book? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to the book not by my own self, but with the blessings of the sadhus. That is so important to hear Shastra from the sadhus because you receive their feeling, their insight regarding that message, what's moving their heart. So that will move my heart. And sometimes you take the book and that may not have the same 
capacity, not because the book is lacking capacity, <laughs> because I'm not able to take a full advantage from that. So you follow my point, no? Because sometimes mm -hmm. people say, no, no, I'm okay with the books. But the point, if you go to the book, the, will, the book will point you to the side. <laughs> I don't need guru, I don't need salva, I only have the books. Okay, go to the books. <laughs> the book will say, accept the guru, all these verses that we shared today. <laughs> so, uh, so, Krishna Upadesa Marak Nyai Guru Han Ratara Itesh. So, my, by my, that first line puts the second line in context. That's my point. Yeah, wherever you are, he's saying that wherever you are to whomever you meet, which implies mm -hmm. in every moment, which implies you are to adopt this as a lifestyle. <laughs> it's not just in the moment when you give the public a speech, instruct others about Krishna, then you have a parallel clandestine lifestyle. Mm -hmm. No, he said, wherever you are implying, you have to really be living this stuff. Once someone say that to my, my Guru Maharaj, they ask him, I think that spiritual life is a private affair, but you have to live that in private, in the privacy of your own. And he said, no, no. He said, actually, spiritual life means that between your private life and your public life, there is no difference. That's spiritual life. That's what Mahaprabhu is saying in this verse. Whatever you are, to whomever you meet, it means you don't have a place to hide. <laughs> you are to be really transparently presenting this. There's no need for a private life. Why do you need a private life? Only because you are doing something you don't want others to know. <laughs> <laughs> because if you are living a virtuous life, pure life, healthy life, I mean, as much as others know of that, the better. <laughs> They will benefit, they will be blessed, you will be happy to share that. But as, the more you still keep some privacy, it means you want to hide something from somewhere. And of course, someday we'll have to reach the conclusion, I can't hide anything, at least from, from someone. <laughs> I can make a show and, and, and cheat so many others, but regarding Krishna, regarding Guru, I can't hide anything. I have to stop cheating myself, thinking that Okay, Gurudev's coming, mm, Gurudev's leaving. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think Mahaprabhu in the first line is implying all the things. So we have to understand what he means there. And then he said, yes, by my order, become a guru and save this land. The second line sounds like, <laughs> like I empower you, go initiate everyone and save the whole planet Earth. <laughs> yes, similar to the last line of the Upadishamrita that we mentioned today. Right? You, you can make the whole Earth your disciple if <laughs> so you have to under, we have to understand all the things because you have made copy paste, quick copy paste of the verses and recite them. And, you try to initiate someone with, without being yourself even on some platform and that will be hell eventually for you and for the other person so yeah he said by my order but he already gave an order before <laughs> live your life in such a way and and, and, and and of course also you you could add to that when mahaprabhu was present on earth and saying these things some did you say with many charities mahaprabhu for, he he gave prem just by looking at people, or people looking at him, they attain prem. So that's really extreme. But it is said that after Mahaprabhu left this world, we are to attain that same goal by adopting the proper means, because he's no longer, I mean, he is there, but in one way or another, it's, it's a different level of dispensation and it's okay. I mean, we shouldn't, I know, I, I just want to receive the glance and attain prem without much, and that was a particular form of privacy that he was so like, but now that he has ended his manifest pastimes, if you will, on earth, uh, we are to adopt the really the necessary means of sadhana for that. So the, the same idea, maybe he was there and he said, by my order become a guru, and he just look at someone, and empower that person to be able to do that. But the point is, <laughs> yeah, that not, that's not necessarily my case. That's more an exception to the rule that the, the, the general rule. So there are the different ways of understanding the verse, but all of them in, in the same 
sovereign direction. Like, yeah, he's given an order. He wants all of us to be gurus. And also guru, to be guru doesn't mean necessarily you will have a di be a diksha guru because sometimes mm -hmm. people understand guru like a give initiation. No, you can be a siksha guru. And guru basically means, even if you say you have to become acharya, <laughs> Sometimes the terms may be misleading. Some people think Acharya means you open a mission and you give initiation. No, Acharya means you teach by Achar, by example. Technically speaking, that's the meaning of Acharya. You teach by example. So in that sense, everyone has to be an Acharya. <laughs> so and Acharya sometimes say nothing with Guru. So if Mahaprabhu is saying, become a Guru, he, we could say he's saying, teach by example. <laughs> And free this land again. It's not that you have to put on your back a burden. Okay, I have to to make every, all the planet Earth go to Golok Brindavan in this lifetime. Mahaprabhu is giving me that responsibility. That's more like an identity dysfunctionality in yourself. Like who you think you are. I mean, <laughs> and of course, even if you want to think in those terms, okay, Mahaprabhu is, is asking me to <laughs> to deliver the whole planet. How will I do that? And the immediate conclusion is first, I have to deliver myself. <laughs> as much as I'm delivered, I can deliver others. And you start to realize, oh, that's not so easy. It's, it's more difficult trying to deliver myself than trying to deliver others, if you will. Mm -hmm. Of course, in one sense, it's not possible to deliver others if you are not delivered yourself, but it's easier to try to do that. If you will. <laughs> it's easier to try to deliver others than to try to deliver yourself. Then you realize, oh, this is not easy. So sometimes in the name of compassion, we can be really evasive. No, no, I want to preach and I want to help others and save others. But where are you standing? How, how much safe you are first? And sometimes trying to help others is just an excuse not to do your inner work. Because doing inner work is not a selfish thing also. I mean, that's the point. For example, when Prahlad Maharaj is saying uh, his prayers to Nisim Hadev, he criticizes those who are concerned only for their own salvation. Yeah? What? Yeah, this, yeah, those who only, yeah. We have to understand what that he mean there, because sometimes I've heard about saying, oh, they're, Prahlad is criticizing the Bajan and Nandis, yes. but it's not like that. I mean, how you will criticize the Bajan and Nandi? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and some of would take that verse out of context. Therefore, we have to preach to everyone. Yeah. I mean, I'm not against preaching. I'm trying to do that in this precise moment. <laughs> this is also preaching, not only outreach, but preaching that takes in reach. But Prahlad is saying, criticizing those who are concerned only for their own salvation in a, in a monistic sense. I want salvation. Salvation means mukti, moksha. And mostly, he's not criticizing a bhajan anandi bhakta. Because bhakti is not a selfish issue. He's there speaking in terms of some people being selfish. But if you're a devotee, real devotee, you cannot be selfish. Because bhakti is not selfish. I mean, bhakti is not directed to you. <laughs> so whether you are Goshenandi or Bhajananandi, I mean, was Prahlad criticizing Gorky Shore that Babaji there? <laughs> I mean, no way. No way. So Bhajananandi may, his, may, may be all day long in his Bhajan Kutir chanting three lakhs or whatever, but he's not, she's not doing that from a selfish perspective. I mean, it's just in the context of rendering loving service so it's important to understand this idea because sometimes these verses or concepts are taken out of place trying to justify whatever some some relative idea becoming an excuse not to do our inner work of bhajan and as much as we do that we can preach my guru Mahath would say that what's preaching that's the overflowing of your own practice. You practice so deeply that the results of that practice start to overflow, 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 and start to sprinkle others and touch the heart of others. That's preaching. Because real preaching is to move the heart of others, not just to deliver a professional discourse and saying the correct things. And I did my class. 
you tried, so that's important. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. yeah, but there's sometimes Shia Prabhupada said that to be a preacher or guru is not so easy. You should you should only repeat. <laughs> Sorry again. Um, Shia Prabhupada sometimes said that to be a guru <laughs> or a preacher is not not so difficult because you have to uh, repeat what you've heard. He said many things. Yes, that's uh, true. So it's not that he said that only thing. So. Of course, he was trying to do, again, we have to always put in context. Yeah. He said that when, which was the audience, which was the situation, of course. And, there, and the beginning point is that one. Yeah, you can repeat what you heard. And already that has some result on some level. His disciples at the beginning were not, let's say, Shastric experts, <laughs> Shastra experts. So they mostly could repeat what Prabhupada said. So. But they were sincerely practicing. So, okay, you can repeat that creates some effect, but you know that's that's not the all in all. And we saw that with Prabhupada disciples. <laughs> we started to also serve as gurus right after he left. I mean, it was not enough to say Prabhupada say, if you will. Mm -hmm. So you need to, to have some your own insects, your own realizations. But I understand why Prabhupada said that on one level, there are levels of all these again, guru, and, and that shows, I mean, I think in this sense, Prabhupada was speaking more about not you become a diksha guru and you initiate disciples, but you act as a representative and you're preaching and sharing that with others. So you can repeat the words of your master and that already is having some effect. But another different thing is you really enter into the shoes of, of an initiating Diksha Guru and taking responsibility for the lives of others. That's that's not a joke. <laughs> so yeah. And again, he said many things. So we need to put everything in context because we can cherry pick, take out of yeah. context. As we say, a text out of context becomes a pretext. <laughs> so we have to be careful of that. Sivani so, it's your turn. <clears throat> Just um a comment question like on the, what we're speaking now like uh, so Malvendra Puri was cause of Riksha so you could say he's like, obsessed with Malvendra Puri <laughs> <laughs> no but the, the, uh, he so in a, a, a Prakrita realm you you seek privacy also in the service of Krishna like in the forest so could you say, could you say like that <laughs> But I don't understand what has to do with Balvendra Puri being in Kalpa Briksha. So, like for example, Nityananda Prabhu's guru is Malavendra Puri, yeah. so taking shelter of him. Uh -huh. And also, like Mahaprabhu, taking shelter is Param Gurudev, is Malavendra Puri, right? Uh -huh. So, they kind of like take shelter of the forest. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, okay. So, the question is if your idea is correct? Basically. Just like a comment, but like <laughs> I, I open to get myself corrected. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it's a good, nice way of thinking about that, no? Because we were saying the other day, just in case for those who were not present, that Subhanidhi was asking about what Madhavendra Puri's uh, Swarup in the Braja Lila, what his identity there, because he's such an important figure for us. In the context of Gaur Lila, he's the guru of the guru of Sriman Mahaprabhu, he's said to be in the first person who, who exhibited this type of love that eventually Mahaprabhu pursued. pursued. So naturally one may ask who, is, who he is in, in Krishna Lila. <laughs> and, and, and the information that we receive is that he's a Kalpa Briksha in Krishna Lila. He's a tree, <laughs> not a tree only, but Kalpa Briksha, a desired tree which is a nice way to describe him like whatever you ask him that's available of course we know in Brindavan nobody's asking anything from, from the cult of rickshaws except for some fruits and flowers to be offered to Krishna but even they do not need to ask because the trees themselves like provide them even before they want the work so everything is fulfilled immediately <laughs> so <clears throat> so Sivanidhi was connecting this idea with the notion of private life and the spiritual life, and public life, <laughs> and how in, in certain services in Brindavan there is the need for some privacy. But again, go into the Leela and the appropriate upra conception with full circle we made there. <laughs> and as we say the other day, no, 
Krishna, we were speaking about Brahmar Gita. Sri Radha Sakti with him. Jealousy and anger and envy and fear and all the things that we are advised to transcend as sadhakas. And when you get to the see the point, oh, all of them are there again, back. <laughs> but in a proper way. So similarly, we are saying as sadhaka, no need of pri for privacy. You have to make your life public, if you will, like transparent. But when you get to the point of <laughs> the lila again, so much need for privacy. <laughs> In certain particular leaders, at least, mm -hmm. especially Parakia. Parakia is, yeah, double life. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, you have to hide the whole thing. No, but I mean, nobody should know about this. <laughs> so it seems contradictory, but of course, it's in the context of Lila and Seva. So since Madhavendrapur is representing the Kalpa Briksha tree, I and mean, we could extend the, the symbol of the tree to whole idea of the forest and the forest bower and the kunja and the nikunja and that's the land of privacy if you will there so is, is there a place for for connecting all these points together madhavendrapur representing this notion of the need for privacy in the ultimate realm of madhurya bab because he he's the one connected with this unique type of radha bab madhurya bab so, so there are place yes <laughs> it's, a, it's a nice way of conceiving that and how yeah Mahaprabhu taking shelter Madhavendra Purim is taking shelter in the mood he came to give and that takes the form in, in, in the Lila of course in <clears throat> these conjugal affairs that take place in, in secluded private circles among Christian Radha and, and the gopis some gopis because as we know in certain circles not even the sakis can enter, only manjaris can enter. And in some moments, manjaris themselves will go out of the Nikunjan. They will look through the, uh, what's the name? Um, yeah, there's one Sanskrit term for that. Well, whatever. There are some holes between the forest vines that the manjaris are having darshan of Sri Sri Radha and Krishna's. Loving intimate pastimes out there. It's there, almost like not to our the other day. It's there. You can look for the box. No, I'm joking, joking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. Okay, so something else before finishing? I was, this was just a side comment that came like listening to your answer to him, but my main question is about. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, about. Um, <laughs> uh, the other day you were you were describing the uh, we were discussing about Scripa City and you took like like put an example of that and then but then I I was thinking that uh, isn't it that the demons they kind of they're not lazy in the sense because they're cultivating some kind of bhakti in relation to Krishna, like it's not Shuddha bhakti, but they have like they fix themselves like Kamsa in fear and they are kind of lifetime after lifetime cultivating some kind of uh, enmity towards Krishna and they're kind of investing themselves in that direction and ultimately getting to meet Krishna, they attain perfection, uh, being killed by him, let's say. And so like, my question is like, is there any lazy person actually meeting Krishna? <laughs> or is it like, you have to love him or hate him? Like, <laughs> Some intense yeah. uh, feeling without it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get the point. Yeah, I will say that when, when our acharyas say that Putana is an example of Kripa City, so Kripa City just in case means that Krishna is bestowing perfection uh, through mercy, that's technically the term, but of course it doesn't mean that if you uh, pursue Sadhana City or perfection through practice as we should do, there's no mercy involved whatsoever. It doesn't mean that you follow. Because if you say, oh, Kripa City means mercy, so Sadhana City, what does it mean? Mm -hmm. I attain perfection, but my own strength in my Sadhana, my merit, no. 
again, the rule sadhana means I make effort to obtain grace. So still grace is even predominant. It's not that, okay, it's 50-50. No, no, our part is big one for us, but still small in the whole equation regarding how much mercy is the main factor there. But so Kripa Siddhi, when it is a Kripa Siddhi, means like extreme mercy. <laughs> like you have not done any single speck of dust of sadhana in your life. <laughs> and Krishna just whimsically said to you, go there. <laughs> so I will take that in connection to Putana in, in that particular birth, like an example, because even though you can go to to some other Puranas, and there are some stories of Putana's previous life, and you can make connections even more to the point of something was there, so it's, well, it's not strictly Kirupas or something. But the idea is how it, the Lila plays itself out in that particular birth, if you will. And she, again, she's not a sadhaka, she's not chanting around, she's not studying Bhagavad. I mean, she's part of the Bhagavad. <laughs> But the point is, she wants to kill Krishna in the worst possible way, no? Like really terrible. He's, he's, I would say the other day. Yeah. No. He came, he came the baby to further help us to illustrate examples. <laughs> Krishna was like that baby, no? Old Arya. And and and, and, and Putana just wanted to kill the baby. Try to imagine. I don't want to say now, I don't want to, I, don't, I won't use Rasa Purnima as an example of Putana here. <laughs> <laughs> like she took the baby and she pulled, no, you can make the whole thing. But that was basically the idea. The lady disguised as a devotee, took the baby and everyone thought, oh, she's so beautiful, like the goddess of fortune. And yes, they, but she really wants to kill Krishna. So it's the worst possible thing you could ever do. And on the, on the other extreme, Krishna gave her about Sarya Prem. Not even Brahma Sayuja. That's the point, because in some cases, most of the other comes and so on, they didn't receive Patsalya, Baturya, Sakya, they received Brahma Sayuja. That's explained by, by, by Jiva Goswami, because generally they do not have a favorable disposition. I mean, strictly speaking, to, to think of Krishna in terms of hating him for us. Mm -hmm. It's not bhakti. That's that's example given when 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 Jiva Goswami explains the term anukul in in the definition of bhakti in bhakti rasamrita sindhu anya bilasita sunyam gyan karma dina britam anukul yena krishnanu silanam bhakti rutam. So he's basically bhakti utam bhakti. Our bhakti is described as doing things that if, in brief words, not this part. Doing things that are uh, pleasurable to Krishna, that Krishna likes, but anukulena, which means what? Well, with the intention of pleasing, favorable intention. Anukul means favorable. So you should not only do that with pleases Krishna, but you should have the intention of pleasing Krishna. Follow. You can incidentally do something that pleases Krishna. But you don't have the intention of pleasing him. Kamsa is example. He was thinking about Krishna 24-7, all day. So that pleases Krishna. Satatam, what is Satatam Vishnu? What is Smart Smarta Vyasa Satatam Vishnu? You should always think about him, what Kamsa was doing. That. But Anukulena, no. Pratikulena. <laughs> he wanted to kill Krishna. He was, you know, so. And nonetheless, again, the point is just the fact of thinking of Krishna, even unfavorably, that's one famous verse in the Bhagavatam that is mentioned, even by thinking him with fear, with this desire, with this emotion, everyone that just contacts him is blessed. But the point is, there are levels of blessings for us. <laughs> so for us, Brahma Sayuja is not a blessing. Even though it's technically speaking mukti, in one sense, it's a blessing. You are free from the gunas. I mean, you are free from Maya for eternity. I say, wow, I want that. No, we don't want that, just in case. <laughs> because it also implies you lose your sense of individuality and there is no opportunity for, for, for seva there. But so this is the point, no? I mean, Kamsa, from our point, he, he was not engaging in bhakti. He was yeah, thinking of Krishna, 
but now with favorable attitude. So mm -hmm. our bhakti is anukul bhakti. So here is here is it. Mm -hmm. Brahma Sayuja, Jiva Goswami explains, I think, in Krishna Sandarbha, that when these demons that only hate Krishna, really, they are not engaged in sadhana, they were not uh, jai bijai appearing as demons, because there are different cases. Not every demon is a gatekeeper from by Kuntha also. Mm -hmm. or, or every demon is only a demon. There are different situations here. So he said that when a demon who has no, no devotional background and just hates Krishna forever, <laughs> <laughs> eventually is killed by Krishna, or we'll say by Vishnu, the Vishnu portion in him, as we know, uh, the pur he's purified by that contact all the anarthas that that person had, all the negativity is totally disappeared by contact with you know, Sudarshan. But since the person didn't have any favorable attitude towards Krishna, any desire to render favorable service whatsoever, that person is not given any standing in Sarupya, Samipya, well, but Brahma Sayuja, which represents this state. You are totally free from Maya Shakti. But also, I will say totally free from Swarup Shakti, mostly. There is some tinge of that that allows you to obtain the Mukti. But Brahma Sayuja. So that's why almost all these demons attain that position, because they didn't have a favorable disposition. So now, the, again, goes the example goes back to Putana, and that's, you could say, but, but she attained, but Salya Vav. <laughs> so... And that's why you would have said, oh, I mean, this is totally madness. Man, this is too extreme. She was the worst of all the demons in one sense. She wanted, they wanted, she was the one, the one who wanted to kill Krishna in the most, how do you say in English, nefarious, mm -hmm. nefarious way. And she obtained the highest possible result that all the other demons, all the other demons mostly entered Brahma Sayuja, one after the other, Brahma Sayuja, Brahma Sayuja. Brahma Sayuja, <laughs> but Salya Bhav in Walaupi. So that's, an, again, an extreme example of Kripa City. Even if you want to, again, analyze Putin's previous background and find some reason for that to happen and so on. But there, Bhagavatam wants to make a point that that's possible. Even, even if Putin had no background whatsoever and was the worst possible person on earth, Adolf Hitler multiply a thousand times. <laughs> I will try to illustrate that. If Krishna wants to bestow Mukti, I mean, not Mukti, but Prem, you cannot do anything. And that's also an important point for us as we spoke yes, recently, because sometimes we are not yet able to fully deal with the principle of mercy. Uh, not only because of what I said the other day, the humility it requires of dealing with something that you won't deserve forever, forever <laughs> but also because sometimes someone receives extreme mercy. And you may immediately feel, why? Why, why not, Krishna will tell you. That's how mercy works. There's no reason. Costless. Costless from the part, from the receiver. He, he she did not do anything to deserve that. But for me, uh, I have my own causes. But Salia, and you cannot just say, I complain about this. I disagree with you. <laughs> that person doesn't deserve that mercy. And he say, that's the whole point about mercy. You don't deserve that. To follow. So if Krishna wants to send Adolf Hitler as a handmaiden to Golok Brindavan right now, <laughs> he can do that. And we should feel okay with that. But you should analyze yourself. How do I feel with if that's to happen? I mean, Putin is, in one sense, much worse. If you want to kill Krishna as a baby. <laughs> so we should know how, what's, we should pay attention to what's happening inside of us when we are faced with this type of example. I'm okay, I accept that, or I'm thinking, oh, this shouldn't be happening, and still some like, remain, remainders of justice are there, and I'm not yet willing to allow mercy to to free, freely flow. I mean, mercy will freely flow. I will be the one stagnated there. <laughs> so, some of the implications of, of, of costless mercy. Okay, some ideas. I think we are 
it's 9 30 so we can stop here and, and tomorrow hopefully we continue with further questions and answers if there were some others and today in the evening we are and we'll be speaking about Mahaprabhu's arrival to Puri, return to Puri, what's, what's happening here. Shila Gurudev ki jai, Shriman Mahaprabhu ki jai, Shri Giriraj Maharaj ki jai, Shri Shri Jagannath Balaj Subhadri ki jai, Shri Hari Nam Sankirtan ki jai, Gaur Bhaktivinoda ki jai, Gaur Pramam, Dio, Panchagal Patru Vyasha, Tibas Hindu Kiri Vacha Pati Thanam Pavani Pio Vaishnavi Vinamon Ananta Koti Vaishnava Brinda Kiza Gaurahari 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 Gaurahari